Okay, so let's start. So we defined initial segment. Remember, an initial segment of a linearly ordered set was a subset such that when it contains an element, it contains all the predecessors of that element. So in a sense, it's closed downwards, okay? So let's show that initial segments, proper initial segments in well-ordered sets are of a very special form. Namely, they are the set of predecessors of some element, okay? So let W less than or equal to be a well-ordered set. Remember when I say a tuple is a well-ordered set, I mean the following. This is a set such that this is a well-ordered relation on this set, okay? If a subset of W is a proper initial segment, then there exists some element S in W such that such that I is a set of predecessors of S, okay? And the proof is easy, but Okay, it's an easy proof. It doesn't contain very good ideas, but it, uh, we are actually using the depth, like the property which makes a well order well order, okay? So make sure that you understand this very simple, nice proof. So let's say that we have a proper initial segment. Since this is proper, it's not equal to the whole thing. So if I look at the difference, the difference is non-empty, okay? Now what can you tell me about non-empty sets in well-ordered sets? They have minimal elements, that's by definition, okay? there exists a minimal element S of this set with respect to this relation, okay? So S is, with respect to this relation, the minimal element of the set, okay? I'm saying the minimal element because we're working with well-ordered sets. In particular, these are linear order sets, so least element and minimal element, it doesn't matter, okay? Now we claim that I is exactly the predecessors of this element. So let's prove that. Let's take X and I. We want to show that this is less than or equal to S, okay? If it were the case that this element is greater than or equal to S, then we would have X in omega minus I, well, omega minus I. Why? Because, okay, maybe I should simply say this. We would have this. Why? Because I is an initial segment. When it's Okay, uh, maybe I should, let me restate this. Since 
i is an initial segment predecessors of x it's a subset of i and so s is not in the predecessors of x okay otherwise s would belong to i which is not the case because it comes from this set w minus i okay this is another way of stating what i just erased okay and so now we're working with a linearly ordered set if x s is not strictly less than x then S is quaternical to X, okay? And so either X is S or X is strictly less than S. But X cannot be S because I chose X from I and S is not an I. As X is not equal to S, we have X strictly less than S, so X is in the set of predecessors of S, okay? So we have just proven that this is a subset of this. Now let's go the other way around. Now let X be an element of predecessors of S. Then since S is minimal, with respect to this relation in W minus I, X is not in W minus I. This is X is strictly less than S, and S is minimal with respect to this relation in W minus I. So X is not supposed to be in the set, and hence, x is an i, thus we have the other direction as well, okay? So these sets are actually equal. So what this shows is, for well-ordered sets, initial segments, proper initial segments are the same as predecessors of elements, okay? So any initial segment is the set of predecessors of some element, except the whole thing, which is still an initial segment. Questions about this proof? As I said, it's a basic proof, but like we are using the core property that makes a well-order well-order, namely the property that whenever you have an unempty subset of a well-ordered set, it has a minimal element. So let's continue. And we're going to use this fact later in a proof. This is why I call it a lemma. Our aim today is to prove that given two well-ordered sets, two things happen, three things happen. Either this one is an initial segment of this one, or this one is an initial segment of this one, or they are the same. But in order to talk about, well, what I mean by the same, they can't be really the same all the time. What I mean is they're isomorphic, okay? What, what's the notion of isomorphism in this setting? Like, when are two well-ordered sets considered the same, whatever that means? Let's now define that. So let S less than or equal to and W curly less than or equal to be two partially ordered sets. A function, a map from S to W is called order preserving if for every x, y, and S we have the following x is less than or equal to y with respect to the first relation if and only if f of x is purely less than or equal to f of y with respect to the second relation. Now, this definition is 
in some sense non-standard, or I really shouldn't say that, this is kind of standard, but okay, pick up an order theory book, you'll see that when people talk about order preserving maps, they just require this part, they just require this direction, okay? Those are called like order homomorphisms. Now, if you just require this, constant maps are always order preserving. Just map everything to a fixed element, it's order preserving because this is reflexive. It still makes sense to work with these, but we're, I, we, I don't want that. We don't, I, we don't want to deal with stupid issues, so I'm just going to require this to be an if and only if statement instead of an if. Now, when you do that, order preserving maps automatically become one to one. Why? Because, well, let's say that fx is equal to f of y. Then it's less than, like fx is less than or equal to f of y, therefore x is less than or equal to f of y. But if they're the same, I can switch the places of these and this still holds. But then y should be less than or equal to x. But then by anti-symmetry of this relation, I get x equals y. So when you have this, order preserving maps are automatically become injective, okay? Now, I can similarly define order preserving maps for strictly par partially ordered sets. So let me say that these are two, okay, I think everyone has written down this definition, so let me do another definition. Now I have two strictly partially ordered sets, okay. Now these are strict partial order relations and we have this, okay? Now over here, one-to-oneness, does it come for free? No. Now, if you define this for strict partial orders, now one-to-oneness doesn't come for free. If these are linear orders, then I think it should follow. But over here, just, if you just require this, yeah, one-to-oneness doesn't come for free just because you required both directions. Indeed, here is, oh, does it? No, I don't think so, it's not supposed to come automatically. Okay. Yeah. Now, a couple exercises related to that. First one is the following. Show that if these guys are linear orderly, uh, linearly ordered sets, linearly ordered sets, then requiring one direction of that if and only if statement suffices. So, requiring one direction suffices. So, f being an order homomorphism is the same as this guy being an order preserving map, okay? Well, okay, one direction is obvious, namely the following direction. If this holds, this obviously holds because I'm requiring something like this is stronger. But when this holds, how can you conclude that? That requires just a little bit of thought, not that much. Indeed, I can show you how. Now, assume this, then you already have this direction. The problematic direction, the direction you want to get is this. So you want to show that if this holds, then this holds for any x, y. This is the same as this not holding implies this not holding. So how can you deduce that from this? You see, we're working with, okay, 
Maybe I should start with this. Assume this. You want to show this. Just because this holds means that OK, what's the difference between linearly ordered sets and uh, partially ordered sets? Any two elements are comparable, right, in linearly ordered sets. Which means that if this holds, then you can say that this does not hold. Or if this does not hold, you can say that this holds, assuming that they're different, OK? So let's prove the contrapositive. Prove that, uh, sorry, assume that this does not hold. Then, just by the fact that this is linearly ordered, you can get that this holds. Now, if this holds, apply this, you can get f of y less than f of x. And that will show you, well, that, that will give you the contrapositive, okay? So, the point is, when you're working with linearly ordered sets, because n2 elements are comparable, you can actually ignore one direction. And this is actually true for if you just put strictly linear order sets over here as well, okay? If I just turn everything into strictly uh, strict orderings, then this is fine as well. Okay, one more exercise. Let, let, let these be order, linear order relations, less than and curl less than. E linear order relations on, let's say that's S and W respectively. Then for any function, we have following for all x, y, and again over here I, I, I'm supposed to quantify over functions for any function f from s to w. So we have this remember I told you that like when you have this for, this does not guarantee injectivity, but when I consider the partial order relations, not the strict ones, it guarantees injectivity. Which means that this, that this is not supposed to be the same as this. There's supposed to be a difference because this guarantees injectivity whereas this does not. And that's true for partially ordered sets. However, for linearly ordered sets, whether you check an or whether you check a partial order, uh, whether you check your linear order relation is order, uh, your map is. I can't speak. I'm too tired today. Sorry. When you have two linearly ordered sets, checking whether a map is order preserving with respect to the linear order relations themselves, or with respect to the associated strict partial orderings doesn't change anything. So we have this. Instead of trying to say it in English, I should have simply written it down, OK? So if you're working with linear orders, <coughs> if you want to check whether a map is order preserving, you can check whether this map you can check whether this map is order preserving with respect to the strict order relations, the associated strict order relations, or the actual relations themselves. Okay, so when we are working with linear orders, it doesn't matter whether you work with the strict linear order associated strict linear order or the linear order itself, for the purposes of checking whether maps are order preserving. For par arbitrary partial orders, this matters. This is not true. Okay. But we don't need to go into the examples of that because we're not really interested in arbitrarily partial orders. We're specifically interested in, for this course, well orders, okay? So questions about these exercises. So work on these. These are not difficult. Now,
definition, two bullet points. Two partially ordered sets S less than or equal to and W strict less than are said to be isomorphic if there is an order isomorphism f from s to w. Okay, so what does this mean? I have to define this as well. There are actually two definitions over here. So order isomorphism simply means that f is bijective and order preserving, okay? So order preserving bijective maps are called order isomorphisms and two partially ordered sets are called order isomorphic if there's an order isomorphism between them. Okay? So that to be order isomorphic and we write we're going to use the usual isomorphism notation to denote that these are isomorphic to denote that these are these partially ordered sets are isomorphic. Now, we gave a specific meaning, very pre we gave a precise meaning to what it means for two partially ordered sets to be the same. If there is an order isomorphism between them, if there's a bijection which respects the ordering, which is order preserving, then we say that they're, the, they're isomorphic. So from the point of view of order theory, they're the same, okay? Questions about the definition? Now, now let's erase these exercises. Here's the, oh, here's the lemma. I was checking out the notes. I think I'm permuting the places of some lemmas while covering it in class, so I'm just double checking. Here's the lemma. Let S be a well-ordered set and F be an order-preserving map order preserving map. Then x is less than or equal to f of x for all x. So what this lemma shows is order preserving maps, well, an order preserving map on a well-ordered set is non-decreasing, okay? So if you have a map from and or, well, if you have a map from a well set to itself, it cannot decrease. Proof. The proof is cute. It's like a, we're going to finish it in three lines. Let Q be the following set. The set of elements such that this is false. Okay. If this is false, then f of x is supposed to be strictly less than x because we're working with a linearly ordered set. If that does not hold, then this holds. Now, if this set were non-empty, then what can you tell me about this set if this is non-empty? Then it is a minimal element, right? By definition of 
well-ordered relation. Then Q has a least element Q with respect to this relation. Okay. Then since Q is in Q, okay, if this is an empty, I chose this least element. Now this is in Q, so it satisfies the definition. So f of q is strictly less than q. But f is order preserving, so f of f of q is supposed to be less than f of q. I just, I can apply f to both sides and this will still hold because f is order preserving. Yes, because this is defined everywhere. But then, f of q is in q because, think of this as a u, f of u is less than u. So this is supposed to be in q by definition. But this contradicts the minimality of q. This contradicts the minimality of q as f of q is strictly less than q. F of Q is in Q, Q is in Q, but Q, F of Q is less than Q, so Q cannot be minimal with respect to this relation, okay? Maybe I should work with the strict ordering, not to confuse you, okay? So, we have that any order preserving map from a well ordered set to itself is non decreasing. Now, a consequence of this is that well ordered set well-ordered sets have one automorphisms, a one automorphism. It's automorphism, like if you look, if you're looking at the automorphism of a well-ordered set, you can only find one, namely the identity function. Corollary. If this is a well-ordered set, then the only <laughs> order isomorphism from S to S is the identity function, okay? Remember, this is the identity relation, which is the function, so this is the identity function on S. Why? Because, let's say that this is an order isomorphism. By this lemma, x is less than or equal to f of x. If this is an order isomorphism, it has an inverse, and the inverse is also an order isomorphism. It's, the inverse is in particular order preserving. So apply this lemma to now f inverse. I have x is less than or equal to f of x, s, x is less than or equal to f inverse of x. So from those two, you can conclude that x is f of x, okay? So the automorphism group of well-ordered sets is, it's trivial, it's, it has one element, namely the identity, okay? So let's keep that corollary on board. Now another corollary that I want to talk about, before that I need an exercise. Exercise. Okay, let me state the corollary, then I'll write down the exercise. Let P be a well-ordered set and little p be an element of P. Now let less than or equal to sub P be the restriction of this relation to predecessors of P. Then the set and the set are not isomorphic. This is an important lemma. We're going to use this a lot in the proof that's about to come. 
Now, in order to understand, like, in order for the statement to make sense, we have to know a fact, namely the fact that if you have an order relation, if you restrict your relation to a subset, that's still an order relation, and that's the exercise I'm going to write down. So let x e be a partially or respectively linearly or well ordered set. So let this be a partial order or linear order of the relation. And let's y be let y be a subset of x. Set f to be the restriction of this relation to y. Okay? So I'm just restricting this relation to y. What does that mean? I'm taking, this is a set of tuples, this is a set of ordered pairs. I'm taking all ordered pairs where the components are coming from y. Now this is obviously a subset of y cross y, so this is a relational y. I'm claiming that this is also an order relation. So this is a partial order relation. And if this is a linear order, this is a linear order as well, respectively linear or well ordered set. So if you have a order relation, if you, have, if you pick any subset, if you restrict everything to that subset, you still have an order relation. And the important thing is, when this is a well order, when this is a well order relation, this is a well order relation as well. When this is a linear order relation, this is a linear order relation as well. Why? That actually, like, you're supposed to do this. This is an exercise, but think of it like this. Let's say that this is a linear order relation. Then any two elements are comparable, right? Is it possible for two elements of Y to be non-comparable, incomparable? No, because if you can compare it over there, when you restrict your relation, you're also comparing it over to here. If to pick any two elements of y, if they're related in E, then by definition of f, they're also related by f. Let's say that this is a well order, and this is not. How can this be not a well order? There should exist a non-empty subset of y, which has no minimal element with respect to f. But pick that non-empty subset, because this is a well order, it has a minimal element with respect to this relation, and that minimal element is in Y. Because of the way I defined this, that will also be a minimal element with respect to F, okay? So write it down, it's gonna automatically follow. Now, why did we need this exercise in order to understand this? Because, you see, I'm dealing with a restriction of a well ordered relation. I have a well-ordered set, I pick an element, and I look at the restriction of this relation to the predecessors of this guy. Now, in future, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to drop this P. When I do this, you're supposed to automatically understand that, okay, this relation is actually defined on the big set, but I'm restricting it, restricting it to the small set. But for now, I'm just going to write this down like this. Now, this is a well-ordered this is a valid relation, so is this, by the exercise. The question is, are these isomorphic? Can they be isomorphic? The answer turns out to be no. No well-ordered set is isomorphic to an initial segment of itself, okay? Now let's understand why this is the case on picture, then we'll write down the proof. This is a well-ordered set, P. Okay, <laughs> let's say that I have this element little p, and this is the predecessors of p, this is the stuff below p. Let's say that these are isomorphic. So let me put this so that you don't confuse this p and this p. So this is the set p, and this is that. Now let's say that these are isomorphic by some function f. Let me pick any element, any guy. Indeed, let me pick P, okay? So P is over here. Where is F of P? F of P is over here. It's less than P because it's supposed to fall into the predecessors of P. Now, let me look at the image of F of P. 
f of f of p is supposed to be less than this. Now I'm going to keep doing this. If I keep doing this, then I'm going to get an infinite descending chain. And th those cannot actually, such a, I'm going to get an infinite descending sequence. And such a sequence cannot actually exist in a well-ordered set. Of course, we haven't proven that equivalence yet, so I'm just going to do the pro, like I'm going to write this idea in a different way, but that's basically the reason. If there, if this world set were isomorphic to an initial segment, then let's say that that initial segment is like, it's the predecessors of P, then by just applying F to P, you would get a descending sequence, which is descending, like you would get an infinite descending sequence. But then this would, this, if you look at the set of these elements, that set would have no minimal element, and that would be a contradiction. So let me prove this. Now, I can prove it like that, but then I have to prove the equivalence that a set is well ordered, a linearly, a linearly ordered set is well ordered if and only if there is no infinite descending sequence. In order to do that, I have to talk about sequences over natural numbers. But we're going to construct natural numbers next week, so I don't want to do it that way. So I'm just going to use the previous lemma, okay? Indeed, this is why I wrote corollary. This is corollary to the lemma. Assume to the contrary that these are isomorphic. Is an order isomorphism. So let's say that this F is an order isomorphism. Then, by the previous lemma, x is less than or equal to f of x for all x. Now, in particular, p is less than or equal to f of p. But f of p is supposed to be an element of predecessors of f. So f of p is actually supposed to be less than p, which is a contradiction. Now this proof, in its, at its core, is the same as the argument I showed you, OK? <coughs> Why? Let's say that you have an order preserving map, just an order preserving map from this guy to the predecessors of P, okay? You look at the image of this, it's some element over here, and then you look at the image of that and that and so on. If you take all these guys, you won't be able to find a least element of that set, okay? That's an empty set, take all these guys, take the sequence, that set will have no least element, and that would be a contradiction. I basically concealed this proof in two proofs. Basically, unravel the proof of the previous lemma together with this, you'll see that you realize that I'm doing the exact same thing, but I'm doing it in a different way. In the previous lemma, I proved that this is the case, if you have an order preserving map. Why, why is this the case? Because if this could happen, then I would just keep applying f to both sides and x, f of x, f of f of x, f of f of f of x. Those guys, that sequence would give me a set which has no minimal element. 
So I'm basically doing the exact same thing. Like I'm doing the exact same thing I showed you on the picture, except I'm doing it in two proofs, and I'm basically concealing it. Okay, but that's the real reason why this doesn't exist. Why am I emphasizing this? Because in future, the characterization of well-ordered sets that we're going to use a lot is the other characterization, namely that in a well-ordered, a linearly ordered set is well-ordered if only if there is no infinite descending sequence. There is no sequence which goes like this. It just descends infinitely many times. Anyway, so no well-ordered set is isomorphic to an initial segment of itself. Okay? This is like a three-line proof, but this is a very important fact together with the previous lemma. It is a three-line proof, as you can see. It uses the previous lemma, which also has three-line proof, so in total it's like six lines, but it's really important. You'll understand why. In a second, when I state the next theorem. Now, this is the aim of today's lecture, the theorem I'm about to write down. Theorem. Let P less than or equal to and Q curly less than or equal to be two well ordered sets. Then either these are isomorphic. They might be the same. Or the first one is isomorphic to an initial segment of the second one, to a proper initial segment, initial segment of the second one. Or the second one is. isomorphic to a proper initial segment of the first one. Okay? So given two well ordered sets, they're either the same or one of them sits in the other one. By sits I mean it's an initial segment of the other one. Okay? Now the proof of this is it's, it's good, it's cool. It has some nice ideas. Maybe I shouldn't use the plural word ideas. It is a single idea. But it, that idea is important. That idea is the following. If you have two well-ordered sets, this has a least element, this is a least element. The least elements are supposed to be mapped to each other, okay? Because why? If, if, if you don't send this guy to the least element of the other set, then this is supposed to, like, let's say that th these are your well ordered sets. This is the least element, this is the least element. If you, don't, don't, if you don't send this guy to this guy, if you send this guy to somewhere over here, then this is supposed to be mapped to by something. Let's say that this maps to this, then your map would do this. It will map this guy to this guy, this guy to this guy. It's not going to be order preserving. So the minimal elements are sent to, they're supposed to be sent to each other. Now the minimal elements have successors. Those are supposed to be sent to each other as well, okay? So I have, I have a valor set here, I have a valor set here. This has a minimal element. This is a minimal element. The, if there is an order isomorphism at all, it's supposed to map this to this. Now this guy has a successor. Remember, in well-ordered sets, we have successors. This guy has a successor, this guy has a successor. Now these successors are supposed to be mapped to each other as well. And now the successors of these guys are supposed to be mapped to each other as well. If you are to have an isomorphism between these two guys, then how that isomorphism maps elements to each other is automatically determined. Minimal elements are sent to each other, the successors are so, and these guys are so. And we're going to continue, we are going to continue like this. In particular, the important idea in this proof is the following. If there is an order isomorphism between these at all, then the predecessors of this guy should be isomorphic to predecessors of this guy. 
Okay? That's how we're going to construct the isomorphism. And 10 minutes. Let's have a 10 minute break, okay? And we're going to construct this isomorphism next hour.